Well, good morning, everyone. This week, we are continuing our series going through the book of Revelation, and we're going to be in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, and we're going to talk about the church of Pergamum. And uh, if you don't know, you can see it behind me on the screen. My name is uh, Pastor Ryan Beer. Uh, yes, my name has made for many great jokes over the years, in case you were wondering. And I'm the pastor of uh, Go and Groups Ministry, so all of our mission stuff uh, and also our small group stuff. So if you're wondering who I am, that's who I am. Uh, one quick announcement uh, to make you aware of before we jump into the sermon this morning. Uh, there are offering boxes at the back. Some of you have been asking me about that uh, the previous weeks. Uh, we didn't have ushers in place to... Uh, make those available, but those are available. And of course, uh, for those of you who are online, and also for those of you who are here, there's always the option uh, to give online or e-transfer as well. Uh, so you can keep that in mind. So this morning, as I said, we are going to be in Revelation uh, chapter 2. And uh, you may have heard the expression when it comes uh, to real estate that uh, location, location, location right? You know, the same house, you know, my house here is probably worth a third of my house in Richmond, right? Location, location, location matters. Well, when it comes to addressing uh, Scripture, uh, maybe we won't say location, 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 but we'd say context, 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 right? Context matters. So, what I want to do to help us understand this, is I want to get into the context before, but before I do that, I want to read the text without any context, and you'll probably at different points go, huh? What's this, what is this talking about? I don't get it. And that's because you were not the original intended audience. When John was writing this, he wasn't writing it to you. He wasn't thinking about, hmm, what should I say to the Church of Prince George uh, in 2022? He was thinking about what he should say to the church of Pergamum, right? 2,000 years ago. So, so if you don't get all the context, that would make sense. We live in a completely different culture, a completely different city, a completely different part of the world. So let's read the text together, and I'll point out a couple of parts that might make you scratch your head, unless you've done a lot of research on the book of Revelation and, and uh, history of Asia in the first century. Um, so let's read it, and then we'll kind of talk through some of the context, and then hopefully uh, it'll make a little bit more sense, and we can start thinking, of, well, what's the application in our own context? All right? So uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Uh, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Uh, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. So right away, you're probably like, Satan has a throne in this city? Yikes, what a place to live. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not remove your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas. Who's Antipas? My faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. So he has a throne there. He lives there. Sounds like a sketchy place. You know, if we're talking location, 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 maybe I don't want to live there. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So you're probably like, who's this guy Balaam, and who are the Nicolaitans? Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Why has the dude got a sword in his mouth? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. What's this manna, and why is it hidden? I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. That's cool, I guess. Get a white stone. Awesome. Right? Like, so there's several things in here that don't probably initially make a whole lot of sense that make you go, well, I can maybe kind of try to decipher that, but it's not uh, really clear. So in order uh, to understand this text and any text, we need to understand 
its original audience. And we need to understand, you know, the different idioms, expressions, sayings, uh, cultural norms, symbols, you know, a little bit about the city that it was written to, where they lived. All these things will help us understand what is this getting at, okay? So, if you were not from our culture, right, and you, you'd never heard this saying before, you know, have you, you know, you've probably heard this saying, it's, we need to address the elephant in the room. Well, if you've never been to our culture before, you might think of this, like, huh? Like, first of all, if there's an elephant in the room, how are they ignoring it? And second of all, where is it? I don't see it. Right? But really, what we're saying is there's a kind of an unspoken issue that nobody wants to talk about that needs to be addressed. But if you didn't know that, you'd probably think, how are these people casually, uh, you know, on their devices while an elephant sits in between them? So, so if understanding an expression that is used in a culture is important for understanding what in the world's going on. So that's one aspect of this. The second aspect is the idea of symbols. There are symbols within a culture that mean something in that culture, but outside of that culture, people would be confused. Now, a few years back, you may remember there was that uh, tragic bus accident in Humboldt, Saskatchewan, where many of a junior hockey team lost their lives and many others were injured. And after that, there was this call uh, uh, and this kind of thing that went through social media where people were called to do this, put their sticks out in, on their front porch. And it was to be in memory of those who were killed uh, or injured in the Humboldt crash. So my boys and I, we did this. But if you were driving down the street and you had no context of this, you'd go, man, what's with all the hockey sticks? Like, is that just in case, you know, someone needs an extra uh, stick to go play on the outdoor rink? They can just grab one? Like, take a stick, leave a stick? Like, what's going on here? But if you understood what had happened, you'd go, oh, that's to honor those that passed away in the accident, and you probably would think twice about grabbing one of them. So that'd be a little disrespectful, right? So, so there's cultural symbols that if you don't live in the culture that, and you won't understand what in the world is going on. And then there's also the issue of what then makes a city unique? Because Pergamum is a unique city from all the other cities that they talk about in Revelation. So if you were to think about Prince George, what kind of things come into mind, and you can shout them out, that make Prince George unique? Pulp smell! I've been told it's better than, when, than several years ago, but yes. Okay, what else? Anything else? <laughs> wow, our city is awesome. <laughs> Mr. PG, okay. Thankfully, I thought of a few more than you did. Okay, so when I think about Prince George, there's a few things that come to mind. One is it's, the nor it's called the northern capital of BC. Well, why is that important? Well, because we're kind of a hub of the north, where people come to get supplies, groceries, things like this. We're a hub for healthcare, these kinds of things, right? So we're a bit of a hub city. So that makes us unique. To understand the culture, you need to know this. Another thing that makes us unique, uh, especially if you were to, you know, come in a normal year before COVID, if you came in, say, September, October, and sat in this, uh, in this auditorium on a Sunday morning, you'd be like, and then you came again in the summer, you'd be like, wow, how'd you lose so many people in such a short period of time? <laughs> Why? Because in summer, everyone's like, the weather's nice, I'm out. <laughs> right? That's, that's u very unique to Prince George. That wasn't, I mean, it's common in Canada in general, but especially in the north. Everyone like, it's nice, winter's coming soon, let's get out to the lake. Right? So the, it's also uh, known as a volunteer capital. We put in more volunteer hours than almost any other city in the country. And frequently, we raise all kinds of money for things like cancer. We're one of the highest in the country for things like that per capita. So we're a very generous city. These are different things that make the city of Prince George unique. And if you were to want to understand the culture of Prince George, the, the city of Prince George, these things might help you get a better understanding of our city. Okay, I could go on, but we're not here to talk about 
the uniqueness of our city. We're here to talk about the uniqueness of Pergamum, because that's pertinent to the text. Prince George, not so much. Okay, so what about the city of Pergamum? What makes it unique? Well, one of the things is it was built on like this conical hill. All right? So it's, it's raised up on a hill. Well, that's significant, and we're going to come back to this uh, as we go through, because high places were considered to have religious significance. So it's built on this high hill. The second thing is, it was the capital of Asia, and in fact, it had been the capital of some sort for empires for almost 400 years at the time of this writing of this letter. Okay? But specifically, in the Roman Empire, it was the capital of Asia, which was important for several reasons. And its symbol was the sword. And the reason why its symbol was the sword was this. Because it, as the capital of Asia, had the power to give the death penalty. It had the power to make judgments and to give the death penalty to people for the province of Asia. So it had the power to judge and preside over cases, especially those that included the death penalty. So when Jesus says that he has the double-edged sword, that's significant when the symbol of this city is the sword, and it's saying they have the power to judge. This, the, another thing uh, that's important is uh, it was the center of culture. Like, when I show you the picture, you're going to see there was like this huge theater, and there was a library. In fact, it was one of the biggest libraries around. In fact, you've heard the word parchment before? Well, parchment actually came from Pergamum. That's where it originated. And so they had this massive library full of all these parchments of all these different writings from the time. So it's this big cultural center. But it was also a significant religious center. There were temples for several gods. So, for example, there was a temple for the goddess Athene, who was the goddess of wisdom and war. And in that temple, there was a giant altar to Zeus, which kind of looked like a throne or chair. Right? Where Satan has his throne? Ringing any bells? Right? And so there, and, and there was always burning offerings, 24 hours a day, on this altar to Zeus. Okay? So that's, that's significant. The other thing that's significant is that there was also a temple to the god Asclepios. Now, Asclepios was the god of healing, and his symbol was the snake. And you see, sometimes in medical, uh, you still see that there's a symbol of the snake. This is where this comes from. It's from the god Asclepios. And what would happen at the temple there is there was this pool, and there would be snakes in the pool. Some of you are getting creeped out already. And in order to be healed, you would go into the pool of snakes. Lovely, right? And you would hope that one of the snakes would crawl over you, and therefore you would be healed. <laughs> I'm taking my chances. <laughs> right? That, that, you know, they were not poisonous snakes, thankfully, but, you know, still a little creepy. Right? So that, that, that was another thing that was important. Well, what is uh, the serpent also a symbol of? Satan. Interesting. And then the third thing where it was a religious center, there, there were several other smaller temples as well, but the third significant thing is it was also, as the capital of Asia, the center for Caesar worship. It's where the cult of Caesar worship would take place. So you would come and you would sprinkle, you know, a little bit of incense or something uh, on this image of Caesar to pay homage to Caesar so that you could do things like trade in the marketplace and that kind of thing. So it's where you would worship Caesar. And, and many scholars actually think that is the primary reason why they said Satan lives here. Because if you look at the entire text of Revelation, it's constantly pointing to the Roman Empire, which has set itself up as like the rulers of everything and, and Caesar as God. It, it sets it up as this is the evil one and this is the beast, right? Right? So this, it makes sense with all these things that Jesus would fer, refer to this place as where Satan lives. Like Satan has a serious stronghold in the city. There's lots of idolatry going on, right? Okay.
I already talked about it being the center of healing, so we don't need to go there. Okay, so here is a, a kind of a model of what it would look like. So over here, oopsies, I pressed the wrong button. Oh my goodness, did I ever. We're going back in time, people. All right, here we go. This is a theater right here that I talked about. See here, this is right here. This is the temple of Athene with the altar to Zeus, okay? That middle part especially is where the altar is. Right there, that's where the offerings would have been burnt. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a picture, and you can see it's built up on top of a hill. All right, so that gives you a little bit of a picture in your mind. So now, with all this knowledge of context, let's go back to the text, and let's see if we can decipher it a little bit and then gain some understanding of what could this mean and what could this be saying to us now in Prince George in 2022. All right? So first of all, let's get back to this idea of the sword. Jesus is talking about the sword. Jesus is saying, I have the double-edged sword. He's saying, it's a symbol that Jesus then has the authority to judge. He's saying, you think that in Pergamum, they have the authority to judge, but I have the ultimate authority to judge and to judge what is true and what isn't true and to judge the hearts of people. Now, the sword in Scripture is also a symbol of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So, later on in the text, when he says he's going to come and fight against them, he doesn't mean literally like bring out a sword and be like, up with your heads, right? That's not what he's saying. Some of you are laughing, some of you are nervous laughing, some of you are like, did he just say that? <laughs> okay, but the idea is simply this. He's saying that he's going to fight against them, but the way he's going to fight against them is he's going to contend for truth through his word and through the Holy Spirit. He's going to contend for truth because really what's going on here is there's a battle for truth, and we're going to see more about that as we keep going. So Satan's throne then, and Satan living there, that's a reference to all the idolatry and immorality that's happening in this city, right? It, they're, they're worshiping all these other gods in all these different ways, including having feasts for this god. So you see later on it talks about eating food sacrificed uh, to idols. So part of the thing that you would do is you would eat a meal in the presence of like one of these altars as a way of paying homage or, or worshiping one of these gods, okay? And, and then there was also just rampant, rampant sexual immorality. Sometimes it was even part of your worship to have sex with a prostitute, right? So there's all this rampant immorality, uh, there's all this idolatry, worshiping of other gods, including Caesar, and so it's no wonder, it's also the city that had the influence of the empire, so it's no wonder that, they say, that he says, this is where Satan lives. This is where he has his throne. Now, we see about Antipas here. We, we see that it's, uh, it talks about him being a witness and him dying. Well, the word for witness in the Greek can mean both witness, but it can also mean martyr. So, in other words, when someone is martyred for their faith, it's actually being a witness for Christ, that they would not renounce their faith, and that they would stand firm in it even in the threat of death. So, Jesus actually praises them for this, because in spite of all this, despite the fact of all this pressure to conform to all the immorality, in spite of all the pressure to worship all these false gods, right, in spite of even the threat of death potentially upon them for choosing to stand for their faith in Christ, they did not renounce their faith in Jesus. So he commends them for standing up to all the external pressure of the culture and of the city and choosing not to renounce their faith in Jesus. But then he calls them out on stuff. See, the church faces external pressure, but there's also internal influences within the church that that pressure us to, to compromise or conform to culture, both then 
and now. So if we look at, you know, like, then we go on to this idea of Balaam, right? Well, Balaam, if you go back into the Old Testament in Numbers, you can see what Balaam taught. He enticed the, the Israelites uh, to, to be part of worshiping other gods and sometimes engage in sexual immorality. And these are what these Nicolaitans were also apparently doing. And so the teaching is actually one and the same. Because if you look at the word Balaam, the Baal part means conquer, and the Am part means the people. So Balaam literally means conquer the people. Well, guess what Nicolaitans means in the Greek? Conquer the people. It's almost like he's trying to get at something here. Right? And what, is, what specifically, are, are, how are they trying to conquer the people? Are they trying to conquer them through war? No, they are trying to conquer the people's minds. There is a battle being waged for the minds of the people within the church. There's a battle for what truth is. And what the Nicolaitans are teaching people is, you know... Here's the thing. With Jesus, you're saved, and in your spirit, you're saved, and you're going to go to heaven one day, and, you know, Jesus has to forgive you because he's full of grace. And so, you know, if, if you, if you, you know, eat and take part, you know, your friends are asking you to take part in this feast that worships another God, and you do that, that's okay, because, you know, Jesus can forgive you. It's not really a big deal. You know, it's almost like they were separating things done in the body from from someone's spirit, and that somehow that the two didn't have an effect on one another. And then then they would say things like, oh, and you know, you know, and this was especially true of the rich, right? The higher your standing, the more it was expected that you would engage in sexual immorality, uh, both with prostitutes, you would sometimes have, you know, like concubines, and then you would have um, your wife. And they would actually, there was a philosopher that said, you know, like having sex with prostitutes, well, that was for the purposes of worship. Uh, and then, you know, having it with your concubines, that was the purpose for the purpose of just your pleasure. And then your wife, well, that was so that you could have offspring uh, so that you could pass on the family name. Like, really? <laughs> That's how we're supposed to participate in sex? So this idea that, that the Christians were bringing forth uh, of sex supposed to be uh, just with your spouse in the context of marriage would have been like, what? We don't do that in our culture. Come on. So, so if you were a believer, especially who had high status, uh, your status may be in jeopardy if you didn't participate in these various forms of sexual immorality. And so the Nicolaitans didn't want to give up their status. So they were saying to people, you know, it's, you know, it's okay if, you know, you don't really follow uh, Jesus' teaching that sex is meant to be uh, in the context of marriage with your spouse. It's, you know, Jesus will forgive you. It's not a big deal. Right? But what does Jesus say? What, what does he say will be the evidence that we love him? If you love me, obey my commands. Hmm. Something is not adding up with what Jesus says and what the Nicolaitans are saying. The Nicolaitans are saying compromise of your morals doesn't matter. Compromising, not living the way Jesus calls us to live doesn't matter. But see, here's the thing about Jesus. What does Jesus teach about the most? Living out kingdom values. If you read the Gospels, the vast majority of what Jesus teaches about is how to live in the here and now in order to participate in his kingdom. And they're just, and, and essentially the Nicolaitans are telling people, uh, that's okay, you can pass on participating in Jesus' kingdom in the here and now. Don't worry, you'll still get to participate in, in, in it one day. Like as if God is fooled by that. <laughs> so, so this is the problem. And so, Jesus says he's going to fight, come and fight against them. And he's specifically talking about the Nicolaitans. He is going to fight against them by his spirit and through his word. He is going to contend for truth in the minds of his people within the church. And he's calling them to repent and to follow the true gospel, which 
calls them to live in a way that points in the kind, to the kind of kingdom that Jesus will once allow us to be a part of in full, right? One day we're going to get to be a part of a kingdom where there is no more evil, there's no more suffering, there's no more pain, there's no more death. And so we're supposed to live in such a way that points people to that kingdom. And so when the Nicolaitans are teaching, it doesn't matter really how you live. It's just, as long as you believe in Jesus, as long as you say the magical prayer that gets you into heaven, everything's good. And Jesus is saying, I am going to come and fight against that because that is not the truth. And you are causing people to not participate in my kingdom, both in the here and now and in the future. And so Jesus says, I'm going to fight against this through my word. I'm going to contend for truth. That's what's really going on here. It's a battle for truth. So then we kind of get to some tricky bits here. We get there's a hidden manna. Well, what in the world is this hidden manna? Well, if, if you're an Old Testament buff, you know that there was the Israelites, when they uh, were brought out of slavery in Egypt, they ate manna, this kind of bread that came down from heaven that tasted kind of like a little bit like honey, right? So there was this manna, and the belief was then that this manna, some of it was taken, it was put in the Ark of the Covenant, which was then put in the temple. And before the temple was sacked, the, the, the kind of belief that existed was that before the temple was sacked, uh, someone had come and taken some out and had hidden it. So the understanding of the Jewish person of that day and age would have been to eat the hidden manna meant to participate in the messianic age, right? To participate in God's son's kingdom, God's chosen one's kingdom. So that's really what this is saying. He's saying, Jesus is essentially saying, if you choose to live for my kingdom now, you will get to participate in my kingdom in its fullness. That's what eating of this hidden manna is, is getting at. And then there's also this idea of like the white rock, like what's the deal with the white rock? Well, it was a common practice in that time to wear amulets around your neck. If you were to go, uh, like when I went to Thailand and, and Myanmar, there was people that that still did this today. They would wear uh, special amulets, and these amulets were supposed to ward off uh, evil spirits and bad stuff happening to you and potentially bring healing. And so the name of the God that you wanted to protect you or heal you or whatever would be written on this stone. It was usually like a precious stone. And so Jesus then, what he's saying is, you know my name, and that's what brings true peace, true healing, is, and peace is found in my name. True human thriving, because peace means, the, the, the fullness of, of peace meant like holistic human thriving. And so Jesus is saying, uh, and there was also a practice of giving, uh, when God called people, giving them a new name. And white symbolizes purity. And so it's like Jesus is saying to them, you're a new creation who gets to experience my peace and my life, both it now and in the life to come. Like, what a beautiful thing he's saying to them. He's saying, don't give in to this false teaching, because if you do, you won't get to participate in the fullness of my kingdom, both in the here and now and in the time to come. So don't do it. It's great that you have not renounced my name, but live for me. Don't just be willing to die for me. Live for me. Now, here's the thing. So we get a little bit more of an understanding of, of what this was saying to the original uh, audience, but what does that mean for us today? 2022, Prince George. Well, I think the more things change the more things stay the same. There is still a battle inside and outside the church for truth. Is there not? Ever heard of relativism? Like, you know, your truth can be fine for you and my truth can be fine for me and we'll just ignore the fact that they're completely conflicting and pretend they're both true. Hmm. 
right? There's this, well, why? Why? Because our culture, our ultimate God, we don't, we don't necessarily, uh, as a culture, build altars to worship gods like Asclepios or Zeus so much. That's not really a common practice in our society. But I would contend that our God, and this is, I think, part of relativism, and that's part of why COVID has been so uncomfortable, is because our God in our culture is comfort. We love ourselves some comfort. And contending for the truth and having a discussion with somebody who disagrees with you and thinks differently about something is uncomfortable. So if we can just, you know, make up some kind of truth where we don't have to do that, wouldn't that just be so much better? We don't have to be uncomfortable then. We can just be like, well, that's fine for you to believe your truth, and I'll believe my truth, and we don't really need to uh, continue having a discussion about it, because what's fine for you is fine for you, and what's fine for me is fine for me. And, and on top of the whole relativism, you got all this fake news stuff flying around. So how are you supposed to know even what's true anymore and what's made up? Who needs facts when you can just make them up? So the battle is still exists. And within the church, again, just like in that time, there's pressure to conform to culture and say, you know, it's okay if we, we participate in this. Yeah, sure, maybe that's against, seems to be against the teaching of the Bible, but it's okay. Jesus will forgive us. And there's also, I mean, there's also the whole thing around sexuality, right? There's still this idea that, does, you know, come on, does, does sex really have to be between spouses in a marriage? Like, come on, that's, that's old-fashioned thinking. And yet Jesus calls us to that. And part of why he calls us to that is because that is a symbol of the covenant that he has with us. So with this in mind, I want you to think about this question. What are the things that are battling for your mind and heart? And where are you tempted to compromise living out the values of Jesus' kingdom? What is it for you? Where's that battle taking place strongest for you, for your mind, for your heart? And then ultimately, I want to finish by asking you this question. Will you choose to put your faith in Jesus and live accordingly? Because that's really what the whole message of Revelation is about. Don't put your faith in Caesar and the Roman Empire. Jesus is God, not Caesar. He's on the throne. He's in charge. Choose to live for him. Don't compromise and live the way that the Roman Empire is calling you to live. Be countercultural. Live out the ways and the teachings of Jesus. Follow his example, his model, as we see in the gospel. So, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to put your faith in Jesus and live accordingly? Or are you going to buy into the whole Nicolaitan thinking? It's okay to compromise here and there. You know, it's not a big deal. Jesus will forgive me. Paul calls us, Paul says, yeah, we're free in Christ to choose, to do what we want to do. But he says, don't abuse that freedom. Use that freedom to, point other, to live in such a way that you point other people towards Jesus' kingdom. So I encourage you, I implore you, choose to put your faith in Jesus and choose to live accordingly. Because when you do so, you get to participate in the fullness of life that God intended, both now and in the life to come. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much that you are God and that you are ultimately on the throne. Satan isn't. Nothing in our culture is. You are on the throne, Jesus. You are in charge. And Jesus, I pray that you would give us the power through your Spirit to live according to the things of your kingdom. It is easy. It is easy, Jesus, for us to get distracted or want to compromise and not live out the ways that you have called us to. 
But I pray for the empowerment of your spirit in us, God. God, help us to both know the truth and help us to live it out. Give us the power to do that in your spirit because we are so weak in our own flesh. I know I am, Jesus. And so I ask for your strength, both for me and for those that follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.